Welcome to a new edition of the Daily Own It podcast, raising awareness and taking action. In this first installment, Bryce Devon, co-founder and lead project engineer at Rift Pay in Dallas, Texas, tackles the topic of race relations outside of the United States, sharing stories of his time living in Japan. Bryce is joined by DLE Advisory Board member Marcus Coleman to discuss the road to respecting differences, starting with curiosity, interest, and learning from and about one another. We have an awesome session for our podcast this week, uh, sponsored by the Dooley Leadership Experience. If you haven't visited our website, it is Dooley, D-U-L-Y-E dot D-L-E dot com. Our company focuses on professional development in the United States and abroad. Um, today, we have Bryce Devon, um, a very young man that has a ton of potential, and he's going to share um, with us his experience with race outside of America. Bryce, can you give us a brief introduction on yourself? Yes. Um, my name is Bryce Devon, and currently I am at a fintech startup called Rift Pay Incorporated. And we are a startup that is focused on creating the first real social banking experience by making your money work with people in group situations, splitting your bills, working with your roommates on payments, uh, things of that nature. I'm currently the CTO there, and I am planning all of the development that we need to do and making sure that it's gonna work out for us as we move faster into our launch phase. And we'll be testing our product within the next two months. Um, I'm currently in McKinney, Texas. Our company is based in Dallas, Texas. So anyone that is uh, from Texas, you have some representation here. And I got connected to the DLE through this host, uh, our host, uh, Marcus. Um, he invited me to join on a culture chat a couple weeks ago, which is just a very, very positive conversation about just the different things affecting our lives. And I think everybody should be a part of it. Bryce, thank you again um, for joining us and your willingness to share uh, your story. My name is Marcus Coleman. I'm a DLE alum since 2016, also on the advisory board heading up the Business Development Committee. So Bryce, right now in America, we went from COVID-19, which is a global pandemic, and now we're into uh, extremely heated race conversations centered around police brutality, but at, that over the last few weeks, it has been looking into systemic racism in America. But you provided a story um, on our last culture chat that inspired this podcast, and it was, is race truly just an American issue or is race a global issue? And Bryce, can you share the story that you shared with us last week? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I guess to give some context to the story, uh, my family has a really big uh, military background. My grandfather was in the army and my uncle was in the air force. And now my brother is currently in the Navy as an air swim and rescuer. And my uncle exposed me to Japanese culture very early on because he was based in Okinawa uh, a couple of times. And he was even born there in Japan um, because of uh, our grandfather, my, gra my grandfather being there. And so from early on in my life as a kid, I was experiencing East Asian culture and when I started to grow up, I wanted to learn more about that culture. And so I went to a small school in Sherman, Texas called Austin College. And there I double majored in computer science and Japanese. And I that was pretty much what I decided I wanted to do from the very beginning as soon as I stepped in. And it gave me a whole bunch of different experiences and knowledge about um, our world and our world as it sees us as like black men and women. And my senior year, I had the opportunity to do a study abroad in Japan and I just had to do it. It was the most expensive study abroad you could take. So it, it was it was a little tough to get there, but you know, I, I wanted to make it happen. And so my family helped me out and we we made it happen. 
And um, before we left on this trip, there's a couple of things that I had in my head that I really wanted to bring to Japan. And that was really like our culture, um, you know, black culture in America. Um, Cause I knew going into there after, you know, four years studying Japan and East Asia, that it was probably gonna be a little bit hard for someone that looked like me um, to find their way around Japan. And um, very interestingly, before we like dive super deep into the story, I want to talk about some of some interesting East Asian history. So in a Chinese history class, uh, Chinese history runs more than 5,000 years back into our past. And it's all detailed and very detailed and very written. And the first detailing of black people in Chinese history is uh, a demonic race of subhumans that were summoned by dark wizards to take over like the Chinese mainland. And uh, just kind of hearing that story and how far ago it was, the question of where racism is and where it's present runs much further than slavery in America. And this is that's what Japan taught me um, was that it's bigger than we think. And so when I left to go to Japan, I went to my barber because I wanted to get a specific haircut. And um, some people might know what this is, but it was called the Juice Fade. And if you ever saw the movie Juice with Tupac, it was pretty much identical. I got the like hairstyle identical to Tupac in that movie. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't trying to get it that identical, but my barber was very inspired when he heard I was gonna go to Japan. And he really wanted to make sure that our culture was very in their face when we got there. And so he gave me the real classic juice fade and my family and all my friends were very surprised and kind of like freaking out because they thought I just like went off the deep end. But it, it was honestly something very, exciting for me um so this happened in january uh, about january 4th was when we left to go to japan and after the 12 hour plane ride we were finally there and uh we got some we got a night to where we stayed with the people that we came with on our study abroad before we met our host family and before we got to japan um, we had to send them a letter so I sent them a letter, introduced myself um, in Japanese as much as I could, but also included an English translation. My professor helped me out with that a lot. But uh, another word of caution that he gave me before we left was that um, I'll have to kind of be very open to um, people not really understanding that they were meeting a black person for the first time. And he, we were really close, my professor and I. So he really told me about a lot of different things. And when we dived into their culture, there was just some things I was gonna have to prepare myself for. My host family was great. Uh, the next day we met him and it, it was just awesome. They accepted me with open arms. They have three children and um, the children themselves were very open with me, like trying to talk to me, but I, I couldn't really understand them in the beginning because it was just so such a culture shock to hear real native Japanese being spoken. And so um, I struggled a little bit, but we had to introduce ourselves to the rest of the host family. And this was really where I felt it was going to be a different experience. So we were in a square room and it was pretty spacious and there are chairs lined all across the wall. And so you can imagine like a U shape of chairs. My host family and I, um, we introduced ourselves and we wanted to go and sit down. So we sat down in the center of the U. So if you're just imagining that U. And we were the first to sit down. Everybody kind of looked at our direction and started seating themselves at the very edge of the U going towards the center. And so I picked up on this instantly. 
um, just feeling all the eyes kind of beating down on me because people were like, I won't say deathly afraid of me, but they were definitely afraid of me. Um, so my host family, what they did is the, uh, the mom and the dad sat on either side of me to make it comfortable for the other Japanese families to sit by them instead of sitting by me because it was just very apparent that they were very scared to approach me. And so um, when they did that, it kind of was like a light switch in my head that um, I'm gonna need to do something really big because I'm representing a lot more than just myself. I'm really representing America and black people in America. And this was something that I felt like was very beneficial for the world that I try as hard as I can to be something that they didn't expect. And so we each had to introduce ourselves. They were going from one side of the U to the other. And it finally got to me. Now, just after three years studying Japanese, I, I would hope that uh, I knew enough Japanese to introduce myself. And so that's what I wanted to do because everybody else in my study abroad didn't know Japanese that well. So everybody introduced themselves in English. So I had the opportunity to introduce myself in Japanese. And when I did it, I, I wish I had a picture. I wish I had a camera that was just ready, open on their faces because it was probably the best face surprise expression that I have probably ever seen in my life. And it still sticks with me to this day because as soon as I was speaking Japanese and making coherent sentences, all of the host families and their parents just looked up and just surprised, complete surprise. And um, it, it was very quiet when I was doing it, but I, I said, you know, Braisu de Bon to Moshimas and Sengoku wa Computera. And that was saying, my name is Bryce Devon, or that's what I'm called, and I'm studying computer science. So after I introduced myself, I sat down and my host family was just very happy for me, very excited. Um, and so after our introductions, we all left and we went back to live with our host families. And this was really kind of where it got tough because I did not know enough Japanese to be conversational. It was more of a, a little bit functional. So depending on certain word cues, I could figure out what they were talking about. But for three days, I it was probably the most days uh, that I have never spoken in my life. Um, I wasn't saying really much at all. Uh, it was really more of just me watching what they were doing and trying to imitate what they did, especially when it came to the kids, because you know, as children, they don't speak Japanese super properly like you would hear in recordings. And so it was really hard to hear the inflections that they had on some words. And so I wasn't speaking a lot and it kind of got tough there because there was no one else I could speak to. The other study abroad uh, people um, were off doing things with their own host families. So we didn't have much time to talk to each other. So I kind of felt a, really alone and uh, it was it was just very tough in the beginning, but my host family tried very hard to make me feel at home, and I I always appreciate them for this. And so you know I still talk to them to this day because they did such a great job at trying to include me in a place that was not it wasn't typical to see black people there. And so we uh, went from all around Tokyo to. Uh, the Kanto region um, to Kyoto to see a bunch of different temples. And we were on this study abroad trip for 15 days. 15 days is pretty long in a foreign country, but it went by really fast because we were doing so much. Um, but uh, at the end of the 15 days, we had to say goodbye to our host family and during this whole trip, I, I got to experience a lot of different things. And something that really sticks out to me in Japanese culture 
is the samurai history that they have. Uh, I, I just really, I like the mindset of the samurai, Bushido. It's a, it's just a really cool thing to me. And um, my uncle has like replica, like, I mean, not replica, even real samurai swords that I still have in my room uh, posted up on the wall. And so I, I wanted to get a replica samurai sword and um, I, I got a kimono, just a, a little, really a yukata is what it was called, which is kind of like Japanese pajamas that look like uh, kimonos. But uh, I wore that and I got this uh, rain hat, which is this big straw hat that will kind of like, it looks like a bowl on your head. And if you look at a lot of different um, samurai based movies, samurai stories, uh, you will kind of see these samurai guys walking around with this rain hat that covers their eyes, looking menacing and all that. And so I wanted to try to create this samurai look for my goodbye to the host families. And so uh, I got everything together and I came in with this full samurai get up and everybody was <laughs> kind of laughing. They're all like really surprised. And um, my host family was very in on the joke that <laughs> that I was going to um, say goodbye in samurai language. So they were teaching me samurai language the whole time so that I could really be in character. And the last thing that they got from me was this um, wig. It was kind of like a wig. It was just like plastic thing that you put on your head. But it was the hairstyle of like traditional samurai called the chomage. And it's like a mohawk ponytail thing with like the mohawk slash ponytail coming out of the center of a bald head and so they gave me that wig and i put it on under the rain hat no one saw me do it and when we got to say our goodbyes it was pretty emotional because um just being with a family that was totally different from me that was so accepting of me and they took me to so many places gave me so many experiences and it just didn't it felt like for the first time in a long time that i wasn't being just completely vetted on my skin every time that i was doing something with them the kids um they we we got to play all kinds of games that they did so it was really emotional for me and so uh when i said goodbye in Japanese, I don't remember exactly what I said there because samurai language is a little bit different than regular Japanese. So it was kind of hard to uh, uh, remember it all. But um, I said goodbye. And what I wanted to do was show just like the last little bit of samurai I had on me. So I pulled off my rain hat and I did a little bow, Japanese style bow with the chomage on. And this is where everybody just erupted into laughter. All the kids were laughing. And it was just a really great experience. And it felt like people were finally open to me. Um, during the trip, something that would happen uh, was people would ask about me from the different host families and how I was referred. And I, I finally figured this out after talking to my friends was I was referred to all the other host families as the shark guy, because the juice fade, if you've seen it, it looks like a fin on your head. And so a lot of the kids would put their hand on their head up as if I, they had a fin on their head to talk about me. And so a lot of my friends would tell me, oh yeah, you know, they were asking about you and they, they call you the shark guy. And so there is some dialogue about me happening this whole trip while we were there um, so people could try to know me more because for some people that were 30, 40, some even older than that, it was their first time in their life that they got to meet a black person. And I don't know if you can even imagine that. It's hard to even imagine that, but these people literally grew up as children, grew into adults, and then even further into their adult lives, without meeting a single person that was black. And a, a little bit of a funny situation is during these 15 days, I only saw two black people and both of them weren't American. One of them was Jamaican and the other one was from London, the UK. 
And we actually got to speak to each other, the London guy. And I will never forget how I found him because um, just imagine, you know, Japanese people don't have dark skin or anything like that, anything close. So it's kind of easy to spot out <laughs> different skin tones. And so we were at this big temple. Uh, I think it was the Meiji Temple, which is just a super historical place. And it was on my birthday, which is the national coming of age day in Japan. Um, when people are about to turn 20, everybody visits this shrine on January 8th, my birthday, so that they can get their best wishes and luck for the rest of the year um, for their uh, coming of age at 20. 20 is their legal age for drinking. They call it Hitachi. Uh, it's the only like number in their language that really has a different name like that. So um, it's a really important day for a lot of people. So there's thousands, thousands of people just at this temple, just mingling and trying to get to where they can throw their money donations to the temple and get their luck. But in this crowd of people, I spotted a dark spot. It was like, it was weird. It was like some weird shadow in the middle of a bunch of white, like, you know, light skin. And I was just like, what? And I spotted this black person from the UK there. And by the time I saw him, he was looking at me as well. And so we kind of just locked eyes because it was just such a weird experience to see another black person there. And so we actually <laughs> cut through the crowd while kind of looking at each other so we didn't lose each other so that we could talk to each other. And it was such a cool, just invigorating experience because at this point it had been about a week before I saw a black person. And he was just so just excited because it was his first three days in Japan. And so uh, he, he was just telling me like, I can't believe there's another black person here. Like, this is crazy. This is just like, I've never been to a place where there hasn't. And you know, I was like, yeah, it's the same thing. And I'm living with the host family. He's like, what, living with the host family, what? And it was just cool because uh, we were just kind of talking about our different places, saying I was from America and Texas. And he was like, oh, so you're a cowboy? No, not really. <laughs> Texas people aren't all country, but uh, it was just a great experience. And that's when I realized it's like, you know, every day that we're out here as, you know, black men and women, you know, we don't really have a choice when it comes to representing our community. And like Japan was really where I was taking that hard initiative to do something to represent my community, where I was actually thinking about what am I representing and how am I going to represent it well? And so after that goodbye to the host family, you know, back to that, uh, this was really where people were comfortable with me. And this is, this is kind of crazy to hear, but when we finished our, uh, our goodbyes, everybody crowded around me. Everybody was crowding around me. There's like 40 plus people just kind of crowded around me trying to take pictures with me. And the first thing that all the kids did, they were the first to get to me, lively energy. Um, they would pinch me, rub my skin, grab my hair. And of course they were asking me if that was okay. And you know, I was letting them do it, but they didn't believe that I was actually black. They thought it was like paint or something like that, or I was wearing a bunch of makeup. So they would pinch my skin and rub me and then they'll take a look at their fingers and see nothing was there. And that was when they really realized like this is truly a person, a black person. And um, I think some people would probably get angry at that, but you know, these are kids and even like the parents are the same way. And this is where I realized that it's like, you can't blame people for these internal biases that they have. If their environment doesn't allow for them to see anyone um, different from them, they're not really gonna think much of it when they do see someone that is different. They're not really gonna think about those biases. And so, you know, black people in other countries aren't seen in this positive light. You go on Twitter, you go on Instagram, and you see all these meme pages and 
these big pages, they have international audiences, but most of the memes um, in quotations, hard quotations, memes, um, are just a bunch of videos of black people being violent, black people being stupid for the comedy's sake. But if that's all you get to see when you're trying to see different people, then what? how are you ever going to think about them being a different person than that? And so in Japan, because they don't have access to Black people, all they get to see of us is on social media, on the internet. And the internet doesn't paint us in a positive light. Um, and definitely through history, it doesn't paint us in a positive light as, at all. And so um, I, I talked about another analogy, which uh, I, I like in our, how people see us as spiders. And so if you think about a time you see a spider in your room or a spider outside, you're, vi you're, you're almost deathly afraid of it. And your first instinct is to like kill it before it can do anything to you so that it's just out of your mind, out of the way, because it it's they're weird. They look different than any other creature on our planet, but they're so common. You see them everywhere. And um, there was a young guy. I didn't really think of this analogy. Uh, it was a young guy on Facebook that I saw a long time ago. Um, but he was um, saying that we all see each other as like spiders. Black people are seen as spiders and even we see ourselves as spiders. And spiders you wanna kill instantly. But if you're someone that really wants to make a difference, then something that I challenge you with and making sure it's not a super poisonous spider, but if you see like a little wolf spider, wolf spiders, uh, like the, the males, they're not that poisonous. But basically when you see a spider, is it possible for you, if it's in a place that's uncomfortable for you, um, would you be able to put that spider on a napkin or something um, or in a box and take it outside without killing it? So you're going to have to approach it. You're going to have to somehow ease it in into some container. And then you're going to have to stop yourself from wanting to kill it if it makes any weird moves and put it outside. If you can do all of those things, then you are very capable of making great change in the world. But if not, you know, that's not something to knock your, yourself on too hard because spiders are pretty scary. And from what we know mostly about spiders, some of them are poisonous and they will bite you. But spiders are really peaceful creatures and they don't bite you just because they wanna be aggressive. Most of the time they bite you when they feel threatened. So they're just trying to defend themselves. And with our recent, you know, George Floyd and um, recently even um, the man that got shot um, just for being drunk. And, um, you know, when we think about those times and from the police officer's perspective, it's like they're a spider. You know, in the beginning, they were trying to be peaceful with this guy, but as soon as he made weird, irrational moves that the police officers didn't expect they automatically went to think about okay we need to really put this guy down to almost like protect themselves but it's like if it was any other kind of person they don't really see them as spiders and so when they make irrational moves it's not really something that feels antagonistic to them um but this is like a mindset that we have to change is if we are us like constantly being seen as spiders then within our own community as well we can't see each other as spiders um and something that's something i've dealt with like my whole life um just coming from middle school to high school everywhere i've always had to be this person that wasn't going to be seen as the typical black person as people like to say, you have black people and then you have a different kind of black people. Um, and I was the first um, where I didn't really seem black. And a lot of people would call me white because of how I spoke, because of how I dressed. And that is creating this mindset that we are seeing each other as spiders, some, something that different even from ourselves. 
and you know as we move forward into the future to change um how people view us as a race we have to also change ourselves how we view ourselves as um, brothers and sisters and um learn to really work together in communion so then the impact can be much greater i definitely implore everybody um you know black or white anybody to go to japan because um japan is really unlike any country in the world in japan it's truly the only place i feel like that has a very homogenous culture you don't have anybody but japanese people and now you know they're struggling for that um there's a possibility of them having more than 50 of their uh percent of their population extinct gone from the earth because they don't have enough diversity and now there's not enough people for them to really mingle with and it's creating a bad situation because they are homogenous but if you do get a chance to go to japan that's really where you can see how big the fight really is to end racism and for me it inspires me a lot um to do even more because um having that having seen and experienced how big this battle really is it's made me really think about how i can do things bigger than i originally thought um and i think that's the mindset that we need to have going forward and um yeah that's that was my experience in japan and you know marcus thank you for letting me tell my story about it it's been something very personal to me um, my family knows about it my closest friends know about it but um you know things like this i didn't feel like was that important to share um i didn't think a lot of people really would care to hear about um some story from a guy that you don't really know too well don't really see too much online um and so i thought i would need a bigger platform to do it but you know more and more people have been impacted by this story and so i hope to everybody listening um that it impacts you as well to uh do something to represent our community even better and uh, as we move forward into the future i think that's gonna be what causes the change we need past government past money um us as a people and a culture i think that's what will change it the most Bryce, thank you again um, for coming on the Dewey Leadership Experience podcast and speaking on your experience of race um, in the East. And yes. that brings up a big, a big point that in America right now, we're in a pretty divisive time, a lot of emotions around race and police brutality. And before I finish off this podcast, I just want to give you guys an analogy of what we are experiencing and some op, um, optimism for the future. So if you listen to some of our past podcasts, I mentioned that I recently moved to Western Mass from Philadelphia, um, a big metropolitan area, a place where people typically ride dirt bikes on concrete and not dirt. Um, but I bring this up because I've never been hiking before until I moved to Western Mass. And I thought about the people that blaze the trails that I hike. And I realized they do a lot of work to make these trails easier to navigate for the next person. And as more people walk that trail, uh, weeds don't grow. And that trail becomes a permanent path with a little work to maintain. And how is that relevant to today's time and climate? In 2020, uh, we are blazing new trails in regards to race and inclusion. But the work we do today makes the trail easier for the next generation to navigate. So for all of you out there that's listening to this podcast and thinking of different ways to impact their community, um, Bryce and I and the entire DLE community, um, we respect you. And we just want you to know that the future is bright. We're in a great country and we can accomplish all things. Last thing before I close this out, if you haven't been to our website, our website is duly.dle.com. Please check it out. Fill out our membership form. Join our DLE alum and community. That's over 600 people. 
um, from different places in the United States and outside the country. And it's truly a great, a great community. Thank you again for listening. Thank you, Bryce, for joining us. And you all have a great one. Thank you for listening. To continue this conversation and find resources for growth, learning, and taking action in your community, please visit our website. If you have a story like Bryce's and would like to share it on a segment of this podcast, contact DLE Marketing Director Bridget Dawson at bridget at dooley.com.